Good morning, church. How are you all this morning? Let's all stand this morning and let's sing songs of praise to our Savior who lives forever. And then we can join him in a song of victory because of the work he has done on the cross. Savior lives, and we are here to worship him uh, because he's a God who is alive. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Psalm 86, verses 4 through 5, and uh, good to see you all this morning. Good to have you here worshiping. If you're visiting, thank you for visiting with us. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you can join us uh, from, from wherever you may be uh, in the time of worship and, and thinking on the Lord, coming before him and his word uh, together this morning. So Psalm 86, verses 4 through 5, says this. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive. 
abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. And that's what we are here today for. We are here because we have a God who has revealed himself, who has revealed his kindness, his forgiveness, his faithful love in spite of our unfaithfulness to our Savior, a God who never fails. And his name is Jesus Christ, the one who has revealed God to us. And so today, we are here today to call on him, right? We, he abounds to faithful love to all who call on him, and we are here to acknowledge we must call on him again and again. And we call on him to be the Lord of our lives, to be the Lord in this place, the Lord every day of our lives, and we worship him who is our Savior. And so Pastor John is going to be preaching today from Titus 3. Uh, and just a reminder, a, a picture of the faithfulness of God to us, the mercy has shown to us in taking us from who we once were and making us new uh, by his grace. Uh, what, a, what a, a blessing, what a grace from God uh, that, that reveals his kindness to us. And so let's go to the Lord together as we worship him, as we come before him, as we call on his name together. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled that we can come before you and call on you. Lord, you have given us the privilege of communing with you, of living with you, and knowing your presence. Lord, your kindness, your faithfulness, your forgiveness is something that we don't deserve, and yet you have freely given to us in Christ. So, Lord, we come before you humbly, worshiping, bowing before your feet because you are worthy. As we reflect who we once were, God, we are broken over our sin, and yet we are joyful knowing that our sin is forgiven, and you are giving us life, and we have eternal life with you. So Lord, be glorified here today by your people, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All is 
is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in it. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. Oh 
good morning, and again, welcome to Safe Harbor, and if you're joining us online, thank you, and uh, this morning we're going to continue on in Titus chapter 3, and uh, just a blessing, these verses are so rich, and I'm so excited to hear Pastor John uh, to tear into God's Word this morning and preach from Titus chapter 3. Open your Bibles, Titus chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 3 or you can follow along on the screens. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3. Hear God speak this morning through His perfect and holy word. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, Detesting one another. But, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is our story. This is our story. We were lost and now we're found. We're better than no one. We can never look out at the world and say, we're Christians. I'm so glad that we're not like them. We have a perfect Savior And we, by your grace, have been saved by his righteousness alone and by our faith in him. Lord, work by the Holy Spirit. Soften hearts this morning. Turn hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And for those of us who know you, but maybe we just aren't following you. We aren't being obedient. We aren't being loving. We're tending to be more like we used to be. Lord, enliven our hearts as only you can. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, and you can send the uh, you can send your kids downstairs if you'd like, or they can stay up here. Well, thank you, praise team. That was awesome. It is a joy to be in front of you this morning and preaching from God's word. Don't look back. No, I'm not talking about the rocks on my Boston. And I wasn't trying to just make you look. Although I think I saw a couple people do that. Not sure. I'm referring to the many voices in the world right now and in our country saying, don't look back. We need to erase our history and get rid of our past lest we be offended. Now, in the public realm, they tend to do this by tearing down statues, uh, defacing uh, landmarks, and I've heard of uh, talks of rewriting the history books to, uh, to write out the painful details. And in recent months, we've seen many uh, mass efforts to do just that sort of thing. And that's neither helpful uh, and we're healthy in the long run. 
But we attempt that to do that ourselves, but on a more personal, internal, and private level, don't we? And that's understandable because many times our past is painful and hurtful. Our past is ugly and messy. And our past is shameful and embarrassing. But let me say, everyone's past is shameful. Everyone that's ever been born, because we were all born as enemies of God due to sin. So really, all of our, pain, all of our past are, are, are shameful at that point and in that regard. But I can't help but think of one instance in the Bible where that always comes to my mind, and that's uh, the Samaritan woman that Jesus, whom Jesus met at Jacob's well. She had such a sordid past. And for the Jewish people, her past was just that they wrote her off. She was a Samaritan. So just that part of her history, that part of her past was enough for them to reject her. But we'll come back to that a little later in the sermon. So in our scripture passage last week that uh, Pastor Andy preached from, the Apostle Paul instructed Titus to remind the Cretan believers of who they are in Christ, to remember their recent past conversion. Titus was to remind them to model the attributes of Christ, which leads me to my main uh, proposition or my main sermon point from which uh, Pastor Chad just read that text. And that is, as disciples of Jesus, we must obey his call to model God's kindness, love, and mercy to all people through good works that they may receive the hope of eternal life. You'll have to bear with me. I, I forgot I was supposed to use this thing. I'm, just, I'm thinking about God's word. I'm not really thinking about PowerPoint. Um, so by a show of hands, who here is the disciple of Jesus? Don't be shy. And obviously we can't see your hands for those of you joining us live stream, but you can acknowledge in your heart if you're a disciple of Jesus or not. So all of us here, the disciples of Jesus, all who are joining us live stream are disciples of Jesus. As disciples of Jesus... We must obey his call to model God's kindness, love, and mercy to all people through good works that they may receive the hope of eternal life. Now, from the text, I see three main convictions or three main points. And I'll give you all three of those up front. They're probably, I believe, they're written in the bulletins. But I'll give you those up front, and then we'll go and treat each one individually. So first, remember who you are called to be. Second, Remember who you once were. And third, remember your final destination. So number one, remember who you are called to be. Because God called us to live a life marked by righteousness that is demonstrated through good works toward unbelievers. I'll repeat that. God calls us, disciples of Christ, to live a life marked by righteousness that is demonstrated, demonstrated through good works toward unbelievers. Now, when it comes to unbelievers, I'm going to make a statement that has been stated many times from this pulpit by Pastor Andy. I've stated it myself uh, here and also at other, uh, other times. And that is, when it comes to unbelievers, don't expect unbelievers to behave like believers. We are to love them in spite of their fallen state, but don't expect non-Christians to act and behave like Christians. In this, it's impossible for them in that unregenerate state, just like it was for us. We can't live as a Christian. Now, it may be helpful at this point to go back and look at Paul's purpose for the writing of Titus, the whole letter. And he tells us what that is in chapter 1 and verse 1. You're welcome to turn there with me. I'm going to read Paul's uh, letter to Titus, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So, two reasons. For the faith of God's elect disciples of Christ, for their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So there it is. He wrote it to help Christians live out godliness. Not just the Christians in Crete, but Christians uh, today, for us today. So in Titus chapter 3, verse 3, Paul makes the case why Christians, why the Christians in Crete and also for us today, then should model to unbelievers the righteous conduct he just described in the previous two verses in verse 2. Now, Paul gives Titus seven examples of lived-out righteousness, seven examples of that. That's right Christian behavior 
toward unbelievers that all believers are responsible to model. Not just the Christians back in Paul and Titus' day, but us today, we're responsible to, mo- to model these. Now, Pastor Andy went through these last week on the first two verses, preached in detail of those. But since verse 3 kind of references back to the verse 1 and 2, I'd like to go through those, um, those seven um, examples of lived-out righteousness. So number one, to submit to rulers and authorities. And I think Pastor Andy brought up last week, we don't have issues with that these days, do we? Do you think Paul had issues in his day with that? As well as the, the early believers of the first century church? I think, I think they did. But Romans 13.1, you don't have to turn there. You can mark that down if you want for a note. Romans uh, 13.1 is a good illustration. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities. Since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. That should settle it for us, folks. Number two, the second lived out uh, example of lived out righteousness, to obey. It goes really along with number one, but to obey, to obey those who have authority over you. Number three, to be ready for every good work. Now, when it comes to good works, that's a major theme in Titus. He mentions seven good works, and all but one are positives about good works, and teach that good works are something that Christians should be doing. The one example in which good works has no part is salvation, and uh, mentioned in verse 5 of chapter 3, but we'll get to uh, that verse shortly, uh, Lord willing. But I always like to reference a lot of Scripture when I, when I preach. And so looking again at Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 10, he talks again about good works. If you want to look at that, you're welcome to if your Bibles are open or if you have your apps open. Ephesians 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So this was already his plan. Number three, the third example of lived out righteousness, to slander no one. Who all does this include? Are there any people who are excluded from that, from the no one? It's everyone, yes? It's sland, you know, slander no one. Do you think this includes social media? Or is social media kind of like that ad- adage I've seen on TV about Las Vegas, what stays on social media, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's like that. The fifth example of lived out righteousness, to avoid fighting. Self-explanatory. Number six, to be kind. And the seventh example of lived out righteousness that we are to model is to always show gentleness to all people. So remember who you are called to be, disciples of Christ. And with that as a foundation, Paul moves on to instruct Titus to remind the Christians there to now look back at their former sinful lives and be moved to godliness. So contrary to human inclination and wanting to hide our past, Paul says, do look back. Do remember your past, but let it move you to godliness. That brings us to my second point from this text, and that is remember who you once were. Remember who you once were because we also lived as unbelievers. We once lived as unbelievers. Let's look at a little closer at verse 3. So verse 3 of Titus chapter 3. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Now where is in verses 1 and 2, as believers, we see seven examples of lived out righteousness that should characterize our lives. Now in verse 3, we are reminded with the Cretans that... We were once marked by seven despicable characteristics. So before, as Christians, seven examples of lived out righteousness that should mark our lives. Before Christ, seven despicable characteristics that are listed in that verse. And I would like to go through each one of those. The first one, uh, the first despicable characteristic that marked our lives is we were foolish. And the Greek word there means unwise. So what does the Bible say about wisdom? I mean, there's a whole, whole book, you know, wisdom literature, <laughs> And more than that, but Proverbs is what comes to my mind. Maybe it comes to yours. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. 
when living in that wretched, unregenerate state, we certainly didn't fear the Lord, did we? How could we if we didn't obey his word just to, to ex- simply ex- accept his son? We, we weren't obeying him. We didn't fear him then. We couldn't even attain to the beginning of wisdom because it says the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Now, I'll go a step further then and say, do we truly, and folks, this is something I ask myself when I'm looking in the mirror, do we truly fear the Lord when we openly disobey his word? When we see a command in his word like we're seeing in Titus, and we go, I'm not going to do that. I'm American. Don't tell me what I can do. I don't have to. He's a moron. I'm not going to listen to him at all. Am I the only one that's had sinful thoughts like that? Am I by myself on that? I have, and I've had to ask for forgiveness. But when I look in the mirror, I'm asking myself that. Do I truly fear the Lord when I openly disobey his word? The second despicable characteristic by which we were marked is we were disobedient, which is, it means unpersuadable. And a new word for me, I must admit, in this deeper study of, of uh, Titus was contumacious, <laughs> which I think is a cool word. Contumacious, stubbornly or willfully disobedient to authority. That doesn't describe Americans at all. Not at all. Again, I'm going to turn to Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2. Paul describes this in his letter to the Ephesians in verse 1 and 2. I'll read that for us. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. And you may have a translation say working in the sons of disobedience. third despicable characteristic is we were deceived now this has to do with being led away from the truth being led away into error and so whose truth that's a rhetorical question there's only one truth and that's the truth of god's word god is truth everything else that's contrary to his word is a lie from the enemy the devil and i will throw out a warning there there are religions out there that claim to be christian that are not christian and this isn't the time or place to get into it, but there are ones that deny the deity of Christ. You can't do that. That's against the main structure of Christ. That's a, that's a non-negotiable. Jesus Christ is God. Number four, uh, fourth despicable characteristic, enslaved by various passions and pleasures. We found our source, source of joy, albeit it's a fake joy, but our joy, we found that in lust and pleasures. And that has to do with lust for power, Lust for pleasure, lust for knowledge, not just a sexual thing, but also, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, it's encompassing there. We were a slave to our own passions. Doulos is the word. Pastor Andy has has taught that from the pulpit here many times. Now, as Christians, as disciples, we're a slave to Jesus before we were slaves to our own sin and our own passion. The fifth despicable characteristic that we're marked by is living in malice and envy. Number six, hateful. Number seven, detesting one another or hating one another. It's the same word there. But there's good news. Even though we were born into that and we all were in that state at one point, despite all this, Jesus Christ died for us. Who else thought about Romans 5, 8 during that part? I'll read that for us if you want to write it down. Romans 5, 8. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is awesome news. And I can't help but think of the second verse of that hymn and as well, that life has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Yes. So what Paul described in verse 3 is how they used to be, who they once were. This is their past before Christ. Now, In verse 4, Paul moves on to describe God's work of salvation and who believers are in Christ. So let's look at verses 4 through 6. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Paul in these verses makes a powerful comparison, a juxtaposition of believers' lives marked by sin, marked by grace. So before Christ, we're marked by sin. After Christ, we are marked by grace. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these verses. The but when at the beginning of verse 4 introduces God's saving act through Jesus Christ. That kindness, love, and mercy in verses 4 and 5 is God's salvation to all who believe. Now, I mentioned verse 5 earlier. Here, Paul is sure to state that salvation is not through good works, but solely through God's mercy, through a spiritual rebirth, a renewal, and regeneration through the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit was poured out abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, at that one eternal life-changing event. That's our justification, church. Through this, Christ satisfied God's wrath against sinful man. Martin Lloyd-Jones once stated, to talk about God's love and not talk about the wrath of God is to deny revelation. So let that not be said of me. If you are here today or you're joining us on live stream and you are an unbeliever, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I appeal to you now. John 3.16 is just a part of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I see some of you guys saying that with me. It's hard not to say that one, isn't it? That is an awesome verse. But that's only half of it. We have to look at the other side of the gospel that tells every person why we need the gospel. It's because of that sin condition. It's because of that sin curse under which every person is born. And that's why we need a Savior. Let's look at Romans uh, 3, 10 through 12. You can write that down if you want. If your Bibles are open or apps are open, you can turn to it. Romans 3, 10 through 12. That says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. And if we look further down in verse 23, and I'm sure you know this one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is why we need the Savior. With that in mind, consider what God's Word said in, says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I know you're familiar with this one. Starting in verse 18, Romans chapter 1. And really, if you want a full definition of why we need a Savior, there, it goes into it a lot more from verse 18 all the way to like 320, I think it is. Chapter 3, verse 20 details in more why we need a Savior. But just from, the, from what we've read, in, starting in verse 18 in chapter 1 of Romans, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. So I implore you right now, call out to God where you sit, where you are in life. Turn to him. Confess that you are a sinner, that you accept his free gift of eternal life, his free gift of salvation. And I'm not giving you this model prayer that you pray and you're saved. This is a heart issue, folks. You know if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. You know if he's tugging on your heart. You know if you have a relationship with Jesus or not. And if you don't, you need that. Because there is a very real heaven where we get to spend eternity with Jesus and God and their presence and there's a very real hell where we're eternally separated from God's presence. He will not disappoint. He will save you. He will cleanse you. If you're running from him today, turn around. If your sin's here, repent. Turn around and run back to God. He will forgive your sins. 1 John 1, nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to bear that burden. Don't listen to the lie that well, I've sinned too much. I'm, I'm just worthless now. I'm disqualified, whatever the sin might be. Turn and run back to God. 
And we would love to speak with you more about that. You can come speak to me or Pastor Andy or Pastor Chad. Uh, contact us uh, through Facebook or our emails, I think, are on the website and the phone number for sure. We would love to sit down with you and, and talk to you more about that. So what is Paul's purpose in instructing Titus to remind the Cretan believers of these things? A little bit of a recap. Number one, to dispel arrogance toward unbelievers. Number two, to promote humble love toward unbelievers. Now, apparently, they were having issues with this, with doing the first and not doing the second. (laughs) So Titus was to remind them of the gospel, but remind them who they were called to be. And then in verse 7, he moves on to remind them of the blessed hope of eternal life that they now have, having been justified by grace. Before we look at verse 7, let's back up to verse 4 to read the whole section together just to kind of put it in context. So starting back with verse 4, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7, So that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, Paul begins this whole letter to Titus reminding the Christian in Crete about this hope. We can go back to uh, verse 2, but really, let's again, let's read verse 1 to put it in context. Titus 1 Uh, verse 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge and the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. (coughs) Which leads to our our final point, our final main point, uh, which is remember your final destination. For believers in Christ, we have confessed Him as Lord We have the hope of eternal life in the presence of God. If you're an unbeliever, you don't have that hope. What you have forward to look to is an eternity separated from God. And that's called hell. But regarding this hope, what kind of hope, to what kind of hope did Paul refer what is, was it a um, make-a-wish type of hope, like you throw a penny in it, well, oh, I wish I'd get some salvation and some eternal life? Was it the roll the dice kind of hope where you're like, come on, eternal life, <laughs> snake eyes, not what I wanted. Was it a fantasy pipe dream kind of hope, like you're going to register for like the dream home of the future that has everything automated and that sort of thing? No, this is a blessed assurance, a confidence in the hope, but rather it's a confidence in God who promised Eternal hope, and it promised eternal life. A great illustration of this can be found in 1 John 5, 10 through 13. If you want to write that down, if, again, if your Bibles are open and you want to turn to that or, or scroll to that, 1 John 5, 10 through 13. So a great illustration here. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son and this is the testimony that god gave us eternal life and this life is in his son whoever has the son has life whoever does not have the son of god does not have life i write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life this is exciting we can know if you have jesus then you have confidence to know you have eternal life If you have Jesus, you have his testimony within you. Now that should inspire us to share that hope that we've received with others. That should convict us of the dire need of the loss that God has placed in the circle of influence around us. That is God's goal for unbelievers. Therefore, it is our goal. Not should be our goal. It is our goal. The question is, are we living up to that goal? Are we striving to succeed and, and, and make that goal? Uh, Debbie, a.k.a. my lovely wife, as you uh, know that I normally refer to her, her as, she and I were talking Friday about the wonders of God's blessing and the wonders uh, really of 
just his grace and his love and his direction. And she was uh, commenting about how much she loves our church family here at Safe Harbor and that it is uh, a family. And I, I immediately thought when we were talking about this uh, on Friday, uh, I immediately thought about Isaiah 55. I think it's 8 and 9 where he says, you know, your ways are not my ways. As the heavens declare, as the heavens are higher, so are my ways and thoughts higher than your ways. And I'm paraphrasing there. But I thought before just being open, I would have never considered taking a part-time position and working bivocationally and serving bivocationally, working full-time and, and serving here. But through a lot of prayer and counseling and talking with, with people, um, God led us here. And what a blessing it's been. God has blessed us greatly since we uh, have come here. And so I just say that to say, trust God. If there's decisions, trust him. Call out to him. Seek him through much prayer, and he will not lead you wrong. One of the things that Debbie was talking about, because our church family here is family, it hurts when people leave for any reason, but especially if they're running from God. And she bemoaned the fact of how that must hurt you know, ache God's heart to see people walk away from him, even though he knows it in advance. He already knows it. And then she brought up uh, about uh, Judas and Jesus and how Judas portrayed him and how that must have been. But then I thought, wow, that really applies to this sermon. In a sense, that is an excellent example of showing kindness and gentleness to an unbeliever. Now, Jesus knew in his heart beforehand what Judas was going to do, but he invited him in, into his inner circle. Would you do that? Would I? If we knew someone was about to betray us on any level, much less betray us unto death, would we invite them to have dinner with us? Hey, come on in. I'm making some steak. Can I serve you a little while? Would we do that? But Jesus did. Now, I know the account of Judas' betrayal is a lot deeper than that. I know it it goes into God's will and plan for man's salvation. But nonetheless, it is a great example of kindness and gentleness, and it's a perfect example of denying oneself and being obedient and living obedient to God's will. Jesus is our perfect example, amen? There's one more remember I want to exhort you to remember, and that's remember the lost. Let us not get so caught up in the Christian life that we just focus totally inward and we miss all those lost that God has placed in our realm of influence. The lost are whom Jesus came to save. We were once uh, counted among them. Do you remember the earlier when I recall the, the account of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well? She was an outsider, an unbeliever. And not just an unbeliever, she was a Samaritan. So to the Jewish people, she was just trash. They didn't want anything to her. That was enough for them, to, like I said, to, to reject her. And I uh, encourage you to go back and read that full account of that in John chapter 4. It's a, it's a wonderful story. It's not just a story. It's a historical fact. It happened. So now Jesus treated her with kindness. Go back and look at that and read that. Jewish customs said, we don't talk to her kind. We don't even pass them by on the same side of the road. If we see them coming, we cut to the other side. We don't want to see them in our peripheral." That's what the Jewish thought about the Samaritans. Dear Lord, do you not see us Christians acting that same way many times? Do you have Samaritans in your life? By that I mean, do you have someone or some group whom in your heart that you harbor disdain or hate or resentment? Someone maybe of a different race. Someone maybe of a different political party. Even someone that likes a different team. I've seen some very hateful things, I think, that cross over from just uh, friendly competitiveness to just flat-out sin. As Christians, as disciples of Jesus, we do not have that option. 
We must model Christ and his kindness and his love and his mercy to all people. Now, Jesus loved that Samaritan woman just as he loves the world. He treated her with kindness and gentleness, and he did not shame her for her past. Instead, he offered her eternal life, which she received. She's like, I want this water that's going to well up into me, a spring of living water from which I'll never thirst. I want that. Amen. And Jesus gave that to her. What did she do? She went back to her circle of influence, and she offered that eternal life to the others. And the Word tells us that many of them believed in Jesus the Messiah, and they got that eternal life. And that is our goal, folks, to humbly love unbelievers that God has placed in our circle of influence and model God's salvation to them, to be recognized by lived-out righteousness, ready for good works that others may receive that hope of eternal life that we have received. Disciples of Jesus in this room, disciples of Jesus joining us live stream, will you commit with me to obey his word and model God's love, kindness, and mercy to all people through good works? Will you do that with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, break our hearts. Call us to you, Lord. Help us to decide in our hearts that we're going to obey your word. Lord, we know that when we hear your word, that there's really only two choices, to obey or to disobey. I pray that all of us here today, all of us uh, watching on live stream, would choose and work towards obeying your word. I pray for the lost, Lord, that are in this room, that are joining us via live stream. If there be that person that doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would uh, prick their hearts and call them to you. Open the eyes of their understanding, their spiritual eyes, that they may see you and see the need of you, that they need you, this Savior called Jesus. Be glorified in all we do today and throughout the rest of the week. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Pastor Andy, did you want to come up? And no? Why not? Well, I believe the, the band is going to lead us in the worship. Yeah, let's stand and Music sing as we is. take time to respond uh, to God's word uh, together. <laughs> strong 
And one of the uh, things we do here at Safe Harbor during the month of December, we take up what is called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering to support international missions. Uh, every dollar that's given to this offering goes directly to support international missionaries, and we partner with other like-minded uh, Southern Baptist churches to send literally thousands of missionaries across the world uh, to many places that have never heard the gospel before. So we have a short video that we're going to watch uh, that just explains this offering a little bit. You all can be seated, and then uh, um, if you would just prayerfully consider how the Lord might be calling you to give to this. If you'd like to give, you can give online, or you can give as you leave today as well. So let's watch the video together. 2019 marks a hundred years that Southern Baptist Offering for International Missions has been called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. You probably know that 100% of the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering goes directly overseas to support IMB missionaries serving around the world. 0% goes to overhead and administrative cost. Every penny goes directly to IMB missionaries to declare the majesty of Christ to a lost world. Inspired by a spirit of a gospel-driven partnership, the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering is an effective initiative that God is using to extend His work in a world that desperately needs to hear that Christ died for the forgiveness of sin because of the mercy and grace of God. Lottie Moon isn't the name of a clever marketing campaign. It marks the legacy of a giant who followed Christ with full surrender and championed others to do the same. So we encourage uh, you to give to that. We, we want to be a part of taking the gospel to the world in person on mission trips and things like that, but also partnering with those who are doing that full time. Uh, in various places in the Lord, that, as the Lord calls them to it. Uh, a few other quick announcements I want to mention. Next Sunday, we're going to have a, sh a short kind of family meeting uh, up here. Normally, we do a meal, but right now with the logistics, it's really not possible. We're going to do a, a ch kind of an end-of-the-year church family meeting after the service. We'll be uh, approving the budget for next year. Also, we'll have some membership updates and se just celebrating what God has done uh, this year uh, here at Safe Harbor. So I hope you make plans to stay just for a brief time after worship next Sunday. Uh, tonight, the student ministry is going to be meeting here at church at 5 o'clock. Uh, middle school and high school students will be having a time of Bible study and fellowship and, uh, and a meal together. So I hope you can plan to be here. Uh, also, today we are uh, collecting the gifts that you all have signed up for to, to bring for the Share the Joy uh, Christmas outreach that we're doing to minister to the specifically uh, families in this neighborhood. Uh, we've adopted 25 uh, different individuals from 11 different families to provide Christmas gifts and um, non-perishables and also uh, some information about who Christ is in the gospel. So if you brought those gifts, you can take them downstairs in the back door. There's a couple rooms uh, downstairs you can take those to. And thank you all for generously participating and being a part of that. And just pray that the Lord would, would give fruit um, uh, through that ministry and the relationships we are having uh, with our neighbors here in this community. I also want to uh, introduce to you Danny and Penny Bowen, uh, who um, y'all could raise your hands, just kind of wave, wave. So they uh, approached me, but they've been visiting for a while about uh, membership, and we had an opportunity to meet with them, myself and the other pastors and our wives uh, the other day, and just hear their testimonies and uh, their desire to, to serve the Lord here at Safe Harbor. And so uh, we want to bring before you, a, a, the church, a recommendation to affirm them as covenant members of our church family. So all in favor of affirming them and welcoming them into our church family, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? No. So welcome. And make sure you all uh, greet and welcome them uh, after the service. We're excited to uh, have them a part of our, our church family. So as we close out, let me mention uh, the verse Ephesians 4.1 and leave us with this as we continue reflecting on, on Titus 3 and God's kindness and mercy and how he calls us to live that out. It says, uh, Paul says this, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. And that's really the call that God gives to every follower of Christ. May we walk worthy of the calling that we have already received from him. And let's leave here today with that on our minds. Let's walk worthy today of the calling of Jesus Christ. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Good to see you all. You all take care.